to share this time and space with you. And certainly your emphasis there on uh, military science is quite appropriate. Uh, I found an interesting instance if, you know, in last week's, I believe it's the, maybe the New York Times, to see that Sears Roebuck hired a general uh, to, to head its logistics department. In fact, I believe he was the general responsible for the logistics in the Middle East and Somalia. Uh, we often forget that there's a very definite relationship between business and military strategy. In fact, business and military strategy are one and the same. And that's one of the reasons why the Japanese and the Orientals are very good at their uh, economic strategy because military science is a built-in part of their culture. And to a great extent, unlike Africans, whose warriorhood should have been transferred into business, the Japanese transferred Bushido and, and their warriors into the art of doing business. And they are still then at war with the Western nations. They never stopped. They just changed their tactics and hid their strategies under other guises. Ultimately, they will win the war against the West. The World War II wasn't nearly the end. It was only a battle. If you read the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago, you would recognize that uh, that paper is already indicating that they expect, should nothing divert this course, that the Chinese economy, which is the fastest growing economy in the world today, the third largest economy in the world today, by the year 2020-25, will be larger than the United States economy and the economy of Western Europe combined. Of course, you know, I've spoken to you on a number of occasions to try to get you to understand that our struggle is not just against European men, but our struggle is against any ethnic group that threatens to oppress us. And it's this team, along with other friends, who have helped us to pump out these publications. Of course, the falsification of African consciousness deals with Eurocentric history, psychiatry, and the politics of white supremacy. Too many people look at history as some kind of uh, discipline dealing with dates and events. And they look at history as a way of celebrating heroes and so forth. And this society has turned us off to history. Many of us have made the statements, well, you know, I don't want to talk about black history or black power. I want to talk about green power. In the falsification of African consciousness, we try to demonstrate that money and power and economics are intimately related to history. You cannot take uh, away your history and separate yourself from your history and be involved in the earning of wealth and power and the development of power. If history were that unimportant, why is it that the other people have worked so hard to take it from you? Why is it that they work so hard to distort it and change it? They must be very apparent then that history is a key part of a people's culture and behavioral orientation. We demonstrate in that book how a loss of our sense of history has robbed us of a capacity to finance our own economic development as a people. Because the history of your people is not only a memorial to the great people in your past and so forth, but the history of your people is a history of techniques 
methods of coping with problems and solving problems. The history of your people passes on to you the learned methods and techniques of dealing with various issues. So when you get to know your history, you get to know the anthropology of your people, you can use that history and anthropology to confront various problems, you see, and you won't have to learn all over again and lose a lot of time. To a good extent, our loss of history in this, particularly as African Americans, has crippled us tremendously in many, many, many ways, in terms of our family and in terms of economic development. These people that we call Koreans are using techniques for the financing of their businesses that Africans have been using for hundreds and thousands of years. Hundreds and thousands of years. The Koreans could not outfinance us as African Americans in the establishment of businesses in this country except that we forgot how to finance businesses because we forgot what our forefathers taught us. It's not that we didn't have any money. We have plenty of money. But we don't know how to use it because we didn't look back into the history and say, how did our forefathers organize economic development? And of course, that's one of the reasons why the people robbed us of the history, so that they could take advantage of, of us economically and socially. As I've said before, every, every characteristic that we may call uh, maladjusted in our personalities as a people, in our society as a people, has an economic function. If you would look at any characteristic that we, with which we describe ourselves in, a, in maladjusted terms, you can trace that trait back to economic advantage. You see, the fact that we, may, we have not been able to recall the means by which we save money as a people and finance business means that other people who remembered their historical techniques could establish businesses in our communities and take advantage of us. So then our amnesia, which is, from, is, is what we suffer from most of all, historical amnesia, works to the political, economic, and social advantage of all of those who exploit us. We talk about, of course, the trichnology of European Eurocentric psychology. We talk about the fact that if you are a so-called normal law-abiding African person as in terms of the way those concepts are defined in this society then you're out of your mind. What we call pathological normalcy. We talk about the fact that personality is not just a, it's not really a psychological concept. People think the concept of personality is psychological. Personality essentially is a political and economic concept, you see. Because when you look at personality as an organized system of desires and wishes, values and hopes and needs and motives, which when the person seeks to satisfy them, they consume things. You will note then that the things we consume to satisfy our personal needs are those things sold to us by the people who created the needs in us to begin with. See, you have to understand that. And so by creating a so-called normal personality in black folk, we have had a personality infused in us such that when we behave normally, we work against our very best interests as a people. And that's why Eurocentric psychiatry has to be re-examined and completely restructured 
and destroyed and replaced by an African-centered psychology. Yes. Identity is a political economic concept. If you had the correct African-centered identity, the Koreans wouldn't be in the midst of your neighborhoods today. That's right. Because people consume, we buy, mainly as a way to affirm who we are and who we think we are. So when you let another people impose an image on you and you accept the image that they impose on you, then you go out to consume to maintain that image. Then in consumption, you are going to maintain their power over you. So you must understand then, when we talk about an identity, it is not merely a matter of race pride. It involves, at its depths, economics and political behavior and everything else. So when you say you're black or when you say you're African, that means that we expect a certain system of behaviors from you such that they are supportive of African peoples and African ends. We're going to come back to that shortly. So we want you to continue to buy the falsification of African consciousness. This is a body of works that I'm trying to get out of here before we do some other things. We, uh, before we move together with Brother Maddox into the stage of organization. But we're trying to get a body of work so we can base our organization around a set of literature. We got a large volume coming out here at the back end of November, the first part of December, Blueprint for Black Power. We finally finished it, four or 500 pages. We might give it to you in two volumes so you won't uh, have to take it all at once. But in that book, we are going to lay out chapter and verse, the means by which we can gain real power in America and in the world. We're going to discuss the forms of power, the bases of power. We're going to talk about culture and power, family and power, religious institutions and power, and not that whole bit. And then we're going to go line by line in terms of the various means by which we can develop cultural institutions, economic institutions that empower us as a people. So that after this, the black nationalists at least will not be accused of just doing analysis only. Because the recipe will be there. And from this point on, then, if you don't do anything, it won't be because you didn't know and you don't have the means, but you just don't want to, which is what I think is the problem anyway. But we like to hide behind, you know, you're just giving us analysis, you see. But frankly, the answer is in the analysis, if you listen well enough. And I try to advise people who are doing work Try to frame your analysis in such a way that it has a program in it. That when you get through, there's a program built right into the results and right into the approach, you see. And that's the reason why you have to form meaningful questions from the very beginning. And you have to, you have to, you have to go into your analysis with the idea that you are looking toward a solution. While there are many true approaches uh, to a problem and, and, and many pro approaches that may explain a problem, not all approaches are equally practical for solving the problem. While you can say that racism exists in America because white folk don't love us, what kind of program is there? That means now you're gonna preach forever trying to get them to love you an impractical problem. 
in practical analysis. While you might say that whites dominate us because they have recessive genes, or because they have a penis envy, a color envy, you know, whatever you want to call it, that's true. There's no problem with that. There's no problem with that. Except what kind of program does that imply? That you recess your genes? That you cut off an inch or two? That you bleach yourself? It's a perfect and it's a great answer, but you got to get a what? A programmable answer one that can be translated into real programs. But anyway, we hope you'll be able to pick that up later on, Blueprint for Black Power, and of course followed by the uh, main book also on educating African children for the 21st century, which has already been written, but we just got to edit it, where we will go into the whole African Senate approach to education. Tonight I want to talk a bit about the crisis of leadership and look at this crisis. Some of you no doubt saw uh, last week's gathering of black leaders, Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson, I believe it was, uh, the Black Caucus, and some others, and I'm sure it brought tears to your eyes. You have to understand, you know, it takes more than unity to win. Again, you've got to unify around a workable strategy, around a workable program. Unity is important, but, and, and it is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Who is being co-opted? Farrakhan or Jesse Jackson? Is Jesse moving closer to the nationalist position? Or is Farrakhan moving closer to the assimilationist position? Can these two types of leaderships really be merged? Or are they fundamentally and in many ways mutually exclusive in terms of their approach to the problems of black people? We have to think about that, you see. It's not enough to hug and embrace on, on the stage. When Chavis says that he is now concerned with the economic problems of black folk, does he mean the same thing that Farrakhan means or someone else means when they say they're concerned about the economic problems of black folk? And why is the thrust of the NAACP on economics at this late day in history. You have to wake up. You cannot let any leader become a sacred cow to the point where you forget how to perform a realistic analysis on the situation. Because ultimately it is your individual lives and the life of our people that is a question here. Not the glory and power of an individual person or leader but of the people themselves. And so we see this crisis of leadership all over the place. And it is time now for us to move toward its resolution. I think we are in a better position at this point because unlike Du Bois and, and Washington and the others who were in a sense at the front end of these issues, we have had now 80, 90 years to see what happened. We can measure results. Therefore, we can take an empirical approach, an empirical analysis, an analysis based on experiment, an analysis based on actual experience, an analysis that looks at the NAAC program, WACP's program, and look at the results that looks at the programs of other leaders and look at the results that they brought. So we don't have to guess, we don't have to be quite as theoretical as we used to be. We can say, let's see what the results bear out. 
and let's see if this form of leadership can be justified any longer based on its results. And this is what we have to measure. An interesting case, we'll be back to him shortly. To a great extent then, we're going to have to look at the issue of power, a word that we've been taught as people to avoid and to think is immoral. And it is a pity that we've been led in this direction. Because, ladies and gentlemen, power is the crucial measure of the effectiveness of leadership as to whether that leadership empowers the people. Because we have to recognize that the primary source of the host of problems that confront African people the world over and in America is powerlessness. Yes, yes. We are suffering from not using our potential as a people. Yes, powerlessness. If we were able to create jobs, but able is the essence of what? Power. To be able what? To. The ability to. You see? Power is created in terms of resistance, the ability to move against resistance, to expend energy and to focus energy in changing circumstances in terms of one's own benefit. This is what power is about. Power is necessary to all living things. It is the essence of life. If you do not have any power, you are not alive. It takes power for you to chew your food. It takes power for you to digest it, to convert it into to nutrients so that you may continue to survive. It takes power for you to stand up against the resistance of gravitation. It takes power for you to earn the living from the earth and everything else. You have to have what? Ability. You have to be able to do those, those things necessary to maintain life. You've seen people, sometimes unfortunate people, like some of the children in Somalia, and people in Somalia who do not even have the power to chew, and who must die unless they're intravenously fed, because they no longer have the power to even masticate the food in their mouths or to, to, just, to, to uh, digest it. There is no life without power. And therefore, the pursuit of power is necessary for the pursuit of life and for maintaining the viability of life. So don't let anyone deceive you into thinking that there's virtue in powerlessness. And just as power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, powerlessness corrupts also corrupts absolutely. A lot of the corruption that you see out on these streets, the shooting and the killing and the selling of drugs and so forth, the muggings, the stealings, the robberies and all of this is a result of powerlessness and powerlessness corrupting a people, corrupting a culture. Yes creating terror and horror in our community. Because we are not able, we have not empowered ourselves to provide our young people with what? Jobs and alternatives to mugging, to robbing, to stealing, to terrorizing. Look at the difference between those, in terms of crime, between those groups who own property, who have a control over economic resources, and so forth, who, who exercise political power and economic power in this society, and those of us who do not. And you can see immediately then that the power itself, the powerlessness itself becomes a source, therefore, of corruption, and therefore, if we are to change the nature of our system, we must change from powerlessness to power. And ultimately, though, social power comes out of the relationship among people and persons. 
Social power is in essence collective. We have to keep that in mind because we, we normally think of individuals as powerful. But individuals gain their power for being backed up by a powerful group. Yes. Individual whites are not powerful. What power they possess or seem to possess is because they represent the power of their group. The individual cannot be separated from his or her group. In fact, the individual is a social creation to begin with. The individual cannot exist in a vacuum. You have a language that you share with millions of other people. You have attitudes, appetites, and all of these other things that are the result of your doing what? Living socially among another group of people. You have desires and so forth that have not only been generated from your social interaction with other people and living in a social system, but desires and wishes that can only be satisfied by that social system. You cannot satisfy them all by yourself at all. And yet we are deceived in this country talking about what? Individualism. As if all people can be an island unto themselves and yet meet their every need of the people. So ultimately, social power is in essence collective and it involves two essentials. Intentionality, which we, by which we mean purpose and motive, and resources. When people have intentions, motives, and purpose, and they bring resources to bear in their situation to solve a particular problem. One of the things that we are dealing with then in this community that we're dealing with in our volume on Blueprint for Black Power is the fact that black people in America have tremendous resources. I talk about in this book the fact that we are a nation of people who are from 10 to 80 percent of the population of 117 of America's largest cities. We have 50 to 60 cities of which we are essentially about 50% of the population of those cities above 100,000. We are the majority population in about 17 of those cities. And those cities are scattered across this country. They are connected by highways, roads of all types, railways, riverways, air, air routes, all types of things, all of the things necessary for a nation to function, we have available to us. Fax machines, telephones, all of this we have as African people. And we have what? Money. W.E. Du Bois stated very clearly in the dusk of dawn that if black people could get only a fraction of their internal market, their influence on the economic and political life of themselves and America would be decisive. Now, when I first looked at that statement, I thought it was an exaggeration until I started analyzing the figures. And we started working with the figures. We're talking about a people who earn over $300 billion. Yes. But recognize, as I've told you before, the issue is not so much what you earn, but what? What you produce. Because you get paid only a fraction of what you produce. So if we're getting paid 300 billion, we must be producing well over a trillion or more dollars as a people. Yes. And yet we have a business section that only collects about 20 billion dollars as African people. That means African people in America are spending over 300 billion dollars and the total receipt of black businesses amount only to 20 billion dollars. But you see, I'm an optimist. I don't ask, is the glass half empty? I said, what? Half full. And I recognize that oaks from acorns grow. And I recognize then that that means that African people are spending less than five cents with black businesses. And that says then, if we are spending less than five cents with black businesses, and yet we are providing them with $20 billion, 
What if we spent 10 cents out of every consumer dollar? An additional five cents of spending out of each dollar as black people would amount to a total receipt and earnings by black businesses of, a, of approximately $60 billion. I didn't say $40 billion, I said $60 billion because when you buy into a business, it uses the income also for what? Investment. Therefore, it multiplies what it takes in. So if we got you up to $0.15 cent out of a dollar, then we're headed well towards $75 billion. We've only asked you for $0.15. Cent. You can give me $0.85 cent to the white boy. If we get you up to $0.20 cent and $0.25, cent, we got now black business pass, what, $100 billion and headed toward $150 billion. What would happen if we got you up to $0.30? Cent? You can still give white folks, what, $0.70. Cent. You can feel happy. You can say I'm multicultural. We don't even ask you to be black and African, you know. We, we, we're not asking you for your whole dollar. I'm telling nationalists now we have to change our language. Maybe we just say, look, just spend a dime. That's all. All we want to ask you to do is this. If you make $30,000 a year, pledge $3,000 to a black business. Okay? And if you do that, you're going to see black business transform itself overnight. Just with that. And we look at these other figures, ladies and gentlemen, you won't believe what possibilities we have as people. We have the talent, we have the skills, we have the whole thing, but we are missing the program. We're missing the leadership. We're missing the sense of purpose. And without the sense of purpose and with the resources, we are not going to be empowered. And the sense of mission is of key importance to bringing about power. And that sense of mission, though, has not been established by our leadership. And since it has not, it has placed us in danger. Let's look at this cry for leadership among our people because our people see something here. 40 years at the United States Supreme Court, outlawed segregation of the races in America's schools, supposedly in the interest of providing equal education through racial integration, the majority of black students find themselves in hyper-segregated urban ghetto schools, entrapped in an educational system that is in severe crisis and imminent danger of total collapse. We've had an experiment, ladies and gentlemen. The Supreme Court decision has been made. The busing has taken place. The surrounding of schools and shipping our students out has taken place. What is the condition of our people today? Hyper-segregated in, 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 in the midst of our urban ghettos. So the issue Du Bois raised early in, the, in this whole organizational career was what? What are you going to do about the people who are not in white schools? What are you going to do about the fact that the people are not integrated? Are they then to be made to sit around and wait for this great millennial era when all people shall be living together, black boys and white girls and all that other kind of stuff? Or must we see about the need of our people right now? Forty years that the blacks in Montgomery, Alabama won the right, the right to ride in the front of the bus, blacks in urban America are virtually the only ones, along with other forlorn minorities, riding the buses. I tell you, the white man gives you what you want with the vengeance. He tells you, you say, you want to ride in the front? Good, I'll give you the whole bus. And so now you're the only one riding it. You got the front, the back, and the sides all to yourself. He's got his own express buses and other means of getting into the city. This is 40 years of, what is this now, 55? It's now not near 95. So the issue of riding in front of the bus has not been solved in the way you thought it would be then. 30 years after gaining the right to vote, having benefited from the passage of the Civil Rights Bill, the Voting Rights Act 1964-65, blacks in urban America, you see, can vote for black politicians who cannot improve their plight. 
and can vote for the President of the United States. The only problem being that the big cities where blacks predominate are no longer important as the suburbs in electing the President. In other words, so you see, before we became, became majorities in the United States, it was the big cities and the big city mayors and so forth that determined the presidential candidates and determined who would be president. As soon as you got the vote, the strength of the vote now is in the suburbs. And presidents now can be elected on suburban white votes. And therefore, the presidential candidates need no longer pay much attention to urban black votes which is one of the reasons why then both Democrats and Republicans run hard during their campaigns against black people and the interests of black people. The only way they can maintain office and gain office is by running against black images, against Willie Hortons, against so-called crime and the other things because that's the way they're going to get white suburban votes, people who are not even really being threatened by black crime because it is black people in black cities who are the major victims of black on black violence. However, that violence is used to frighten white folk in electing presidents and other national and state offices. 20 years after passing the fair housing legislation, blacks are hyper-segregated in urban ghettos and in suburban uh, neighborhoods. Where still, many blacks are homeless, sleeping on the sidewalks, under bridges and in abandoned buildings. If you would read this month's Emerge magazine based on an article based on a very interesting book called Apartheid USA, you would read a startling statement that says a black family that earns $50,000 has less choices of where it will live and how it would live than a Hispanic who earns $2,500. So where's your fair housing? What it has it gained you? Blacks are more segregated today than we were in 1920 and in 1940. The whole movement of the demographics of America is to isolate black people totally in the urban ghettos and in the, in the suburbs as well. And yet you brag about your fair housing laws. Yes, look at the reality of the situation. Look at the organizations that led these kind of campaigns. Look at the leadership that told us that this kinds of, these kinds of legislation would rescue us and make us hold hands with little black boys and little black girls. Where are we today? And what are our circumstances? 20 years after passing this law, we are in more trouble than ever. After 25 years of affirmative action, Blacks find themselves kicked out of corporate America, find themselves with the highest unemployment rates, drifting into poverty ever more rapidly, while other ethnic groups gain employment ever more swiftly. And we find ourselves begging for handouts on the streets of America. If you read a detailed analysis in the Wall Street Journal last week, two full pages and a full column saying what? Losing ground. Blacks, the only group that suffered a total loss of employment during the recession. This is your affirmative action for you. Blacks who were 10, 15% of the working staffs of many corporations suffered 20, 30, 40, almost 50% of the cuts in jobs. During 90 and 91, when 60,000 blacks lost their jobs in American corporations, 60,000 Asians moved into jobs in American corporations. 55,000 Hispanics moved into jobs in American corporations. Where is your people of color? Where are these people every time they stand up? They say, black and Latino. And yet we don't hear a word coming the other way. Yes, the white man does give you what you want with the vengeance. He 
says you want it, I'll give it to you. If you want affirmative action, we'll make everybody a minority. We'll bring the white women in on it. We'll bring all the other ethnics in on it. We'll lay a game on you called diversity in the workplace, and you'll fall for it. And then they will say, well, since we've got to hire all these other groups, we have to cut back on the number of people that we hire from you. Now, you can't object to us hiring Hispanics and Asians, can you? <laughs> the most interesting thing about this situation, ladies and gentlemen, is that while we are flowing out of American corporations and black blue collar workers are suffering great losses, with other ethnic groups gaining, this is at the very point where some 60 black people, distinguished Negro leaders, sit on nearly 170 corporate boards. Yes. People such as Vernon Jordan sits on 10 and earns a hundred, five hundred million, five hundred thousand dollars a year for just having his name on the board. Okay? Did you read the piece last week? He's uh, Clinton's favorite guy. Yeah. When Clinton wants to have fun, he calls Vernon. They play golf and go on the yacht together. And, you know, and, and he, he runs interference for Clinton. And, you know, they're just good old buddies. Even his law firm says, we didn't hire uh, Jordan for his legal talents. They just said not right. His 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 role is to play golf and play around. Yes, he wouldn't take an offer to be attorney general because he could have more clout sitting in the position that he's in. And the other civil rights organizations are wondering, say, Vernon, when you're going to give us a break? When you're going to act in the interests of black folk? He said, but I'm out of the civil rights game now. So we have. So isn't it a paradox then, that at the very point where we are being kicked out of America's corporations, we have blacks sitting on America's corporate boards. Some sitting on five and six and as many as 10. Is that the reason perhaps we don't hear about the losses that we are suffering? Is the situation one that by appointing these token Negroes to these boards, we will no longer complain or they have had their mouth shut so that they no longer complain about our not being there, ladies and gentlemen. This is the result of affirmative action, the result of assimilationist program. 25 years after the initiation of black capitalism, blacks find their communities markets dominated by aliens. Black business persons find they can't do business in America, nor with America. After 40 years of being America's moral conscience, as a lot of Negroes like to brag about, blacks find their communities being devastated by immorality. After preaching brotherly love and race transcending love, they find themselves to be the most hated of races. For blacks in America, 30 years after having the ringing words, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. America has become even more of a prison, sealing their bodies, hopes, and aspirations in the dungeons of despair. For African Americans all over, for African Americans, all the promises of the civil rights era have been betrayed. Everything has been reversed. The more black elected officials have been elected, the worse off the black electorate has become. Yes, black homelessness became a national scandal when a black man was appointed Secretary of Housing. The black community was overrun with AIDS, drugs, addiction, TB, and all sorts of diseases and maladies when a black man was appointed Secretary of Health. Black nations were overrun by the imperial armies of the United States when a black man was head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The more black judges appointed to the bench, the more black men became police commissioners and police officers, the more black men filled America's prisons. 
and black-on-black -black violence ravaged America's black ghettos. Let's look at it. The Honorable Supreme Court Justice, late Justice Thurgood Marshall, achieved greater victories in the United States Supreme Court as a lawyer than he did as a judge sitting on his bench. In fact, he sat on the bench and sadly witnessed his life's work being ravaged and savaged by a mean-spirited bench. As a black man assumed to, to become Secretary of Commerce, blacks as an ethnic group are the least ones engaged in what? Commerce at home and abroad. In 1993, at the appointment of a black woman as, as Surgeon General and ardent advocate of sex education and the dispensing of condoms, black teenage pregnancy and female headed families threatened the very foundations of the black family and culture and the viability of the black community. This is the legacy of the leadership that we have confronted, ladies and gentlemen. And we must look at this situation. And under whose leadership and what leadership did this occur? It occurred under the leadership of what I call the assimilationist, moralist leadership establishment. Those people who told us that our salvation lay in assimilating with other folks. We look at this shame as we see more black mayors elected, deteri the deterioration of the black community hastened. Let's look quickly at the federal contributions to certain large cities. Are the elected officials bringing in the money? As a matter of fact, what you have going on here, ladies and gentlemen, is a war against black cities. You have the federal government itself engaging in the provocation of black populations to riot so that under the cover of bringing law and order, they may impose martial law on those populations and destroy those populations. This is the kind of game that hides itself behind a bourgeois leadership. I wanted to tell you the other evening, when I was over at Brother Roy, about bourgeois radio. We didn't have time. You have to recognize one thing, you see. When we talk about the media in America, we look at who owns the media, you see. And we know that this media is owned by about 10 corporations that own about 80% of the media. Few companies owning over 200 cable companies and so forth. And you see the struggle now over who's going to own the cable operation, who's going to control communications in America. And we recognize then that those who own the media, because what? A free press only belongs to the person who what? Owns one. Okay? That obviously if the bourgeois element in America and the ruling elite in America owns the media, then the media will be used by that class to, to, to carry out its programs and its ideologies. And it will use the media to try to brainwash and falsify the consciousness of African people. But while we look at that, we must look at the ownership of our own media. Yes. And see what class of people own that media. Then you want, then you can solve the puzzle as to why that media is always preaching to you about voting. As if voting was the only source of power in America. Because those people that own those stations achieve their social position and power through America's electoral system. That's why it's important to them. Because the class of people that own those stations and control those stations got their position through what? Electioneering and by being attached to the Democratic Party. And one thing that a bourgeois leadership and a leadership elite tries to do is to convince the masses that the masses can have their interests satisfied by satisfying the bourgeois' interests. And therefore, when they get elected to office, or they get high appointed office, they tell you, ain't we progressing? 
Doesn't that mean an advancement for black folk when they are the only one who have advanced and you don't have a new nickel in your pocket as a result of their being in this position? And so they want to make you think that their elections and their ability to wheedle out of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party's money that advance their economic interests represents an advancement for you. And therefore, they fail to give you a true education as to what politics is really about in America. And power in America is not in voting. You have to understand that. Why? If you would even review your own history, you would recognize that what you call your most significant victories were gained before you gained the right to vote in 1964 and 1965. Did you vote to get the vote? Huh? Recognize what you're going on here. Someone would tell you that there's no other way. But what did we say? Power in America is based in America's corporations, is determined by those who own the means of production and who own property. Power and property ownership go together in America. No propertyless people, no people who own no productive businesses are in power in America. I don't care what kind of votes they have. And recognize this, that where the power is, you cannot vote them out of power. Because those who run America's multinational corporations and run America's institutions don't run for office. They tell the people in office what to do. And therefore, if you are to wield real power in America, you must own the sources of power. And those sources mean the ownership of productive facilities and the ownership of property. And the control of major institutions and the ability to weld yourself together as a people and to control your consumption and to control your behavior in ways that you can exert your influence upon this system. But yet we get a medium that tells people, vote, vote, go out and vote. And you're going to suffer all the more as a result thereof. Yes, you got to face the reality. You got to know where it's going. Power lies in strategy. It lies in technique. It lies in alignment, you see. Why were blacks, before they got the vote, able to change the South? Through voting? Through alignments, through alliances, through control of their, their consumer rights. As you said time and time again, that to a great extent the civil rights movement was a consumer movement. It was a situation where blacks refused to spend their money in particular ways and in particular places. Right. And by withdrawing their consumption, they were able to change the South That's before right. a single law was passed That's in right. their favor. That's right. That's right. The just the ability of black people to line up side by side and shoulder to shoulder and to march in one straight line right. changed the face of the South. Right. So what does it say? Just the ability to sit in front of a door and not permit other people to pass is power. The ability to chain yourself down is power, ladies and gentlemen. Ultimately, it means that power arrives out of cooperation, out of alignment, out of strategy, and out of technique, and out of a sense of purpose and mission, and out of the ability to withdraw support by voting in this system of domination in the way you legitimate your own domination as a people. You have to watch. Let's learn where power is, and that's what we're going to be talking about 
in Blueprint for Black Power. Where is it? We have this NAACP, this assimilationist, moralist leadership that sees the solution of black problems as involving the assimilating with people. But I just got through telling you that blacks are now more segregated than ever. So if our power depends on assimilation, we are in deep trouble. Yes. We have some group of preachers who try to tell you that the major problem in America is moral. Yes, that's why I call them moralists. That these people are stereotyped or some kind of way. And if we, if we get them understand, you see these little silly ads on TV, you know, let's stop the hate. <laughs> As if this was gonna change something. As if the problem is hate. If the problem is they have a wrong knowledge of who you are. Come on. Yes. That the problem is one of morals. And therefore, what we got to do is convert these white people to their own religion. And we got to make them true believers in their own constitution. And that way we will be free. You're out of your mind. Every revolution has had to deal with the issue of whether you should struggle for abstract rights a struggle for a right to meet the basic needs of the people. This was the issue that Booker was working with too. He was weighing that issue. Is the voting the really primary thing, getting black people to vote, getting civil rights the primary thing, or should we see about feeding the people first, building an economic base, and then moving into the civil rights and voting thing? When we look at the history of other immigrant groups and ethnic groups, we've seen them almost be silent on the issue of voting right. and civil rights and so forth. As they moved into the black communities and other communities and established an economic base. And then after getting an economic base, using that base as a political tool, you see now the vendors are being swept from the streets of Brooklyn and they're being swept from the streets of Harlem on black folks money you sat up here and you supported these Koreans you didn't see color when you spent your money you wouldn't let somebody else tell you how to spend my money and they paid you back you talked about multiculturalism and yet not a one of you is in partnership with a Korean not one of you is in partnership with an Arab now, one of you is in partnership with white folk. Where are the multicultural businesses? Where are the multicultural economic situations? What are you talking about, multiculturalism? Where is it? They laid it on you. And yet, in, in, in Blueprint for Black Power, I talk very quite straightforwardly about the Korean organization. I named the presidents. We are calling names there, ladies and gentlemen. And they are called the Korean Producers Association, the Korean Grocers Association, the Koreans uh, of Greater New York Association. In that regard, um, as I've said over and over again, black folk need to understand the difference between uh, surviving and prospering. And so you can't do either one of those two things until you, before you get past, you can't prosper until you learn how to survive. Survive means you learn how, you gotta learn how to protect yourselves. Right now, black folk are totally vulnerable. They can't protect themselves on anything right now. And see, in the, um, uh, that's why I gave you this concept of like I talked about the importance of building a community instead of neighborhoods. All we got in this country are neighborhoods. A neighborhood is, is totally useless. And so what, what obviously, so he was on track for the right thing. You gotta have a community. A neighborhood is totally useless. But once you build these communities, you gotta learn how to use them to protect yourselves. Right now, we are totally dependent on other people providing us with our daily needs. There's nothing that we produce in any magnitude to be able to survive. We are almost 100% dependent on other people. We are 100% consumers and nearly zero producers. And then, and then this is what Dr. Anderson, we see all these major companies talking about uh, the power of the black dollar, uh, consumer power. There is no such thing as consumer power. A consumer, so consumerism comes from the word to consume. To consume means to be used up. 
That's why up until about 1950, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Watkins, they, when a person got, got cancer of the lungs, they said he had consumption. Consumption means his lungs are being eaten up. Anything that's being, anything that's being consumed is being wasted away, being, de being, being, being destroyed. And so when you start bragging about blacks being consumers, that's the worst thing you can do. Black folk don't need to be consumers, they need to learn how to be producers. Where the wealth and power belongs to those who produce. And right now we are zero producers. That's why you got they got they got a national movement called it an in, uh, international movement where they want to start eliminating a lot of the consumers and giving more cons produ production power to those who got the money, wealth, and power. That's what globalization is. Globalization is all about. It's trying to get the power. And and, and let me reduce it to its lowest level. To try to explain it to you. I see people talking about well, you know, uh, dope dealers. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, use that as an example because they're producing but it's whoever produces the dope he's the one that got the power the guy that's buying it the consumer the crackhead and and the and the uh, narcotic addict he he's a consumer but he's a weak he's in a weakened state he's being destroyed and wasted away so the power is that always with who he who produces the the, the let the letdown or the wasted part is those who are consuming products and right now we consume almost everything and so if you're gonna do something, go back to the community and start protecting yourselves by learning how to produce. When you, people say, what should they produce? You should be producing everything that you get outside your community. Produce it first and foremost for your own community. But what do black folk need? You need exactly the same thing whites need. You need clothing, shoes, eyeglasses, food, resources, gas, oil, everything. That's what you should be producing. And I see blacks, every day getting into a newspaper saying, we don't know what to produce. Produce whatever, what you need. Produce what you need in your own communities. And then when, once you've taken care of your own communities and producing, and then you consume everything you need in your own community, you got some surplus, then you start exporting the surplus. Never export what you need to be able to survive. That's how you protect yourself. You never export what you need to survive. You first take care of your community, produce enough to take care of your people, and, your, and all your friends and loved ones, then when you get some surplus, you export it out. And we don't do that, but that's what the other groups do. They always take care of their people first, build their own communities, produce products and services goods for their own people. And, well, first of all, we, we I, uh, people constantly talk about the black communities. We don't have any black communities. Let's make sure we're clear on that. We do not have not one single black community in the entire United States. We got 44 million black folk, but not one community. Because to qualify as a community, Dr. Watkins, you must have at least three things in there to qualify as a community. You must have a, you must have a an, an independent, wholly independent economy that would produce products, service, goods, a tax base, and income, and opportunity, business opportunities for your own people. That's the primary thing you must have to separate yourself from being a neighborhood. A neighborhood is where you eat and sleep. That's all it is. A neighborhood is where you eat and sleep. A hotel, like the Holiday Inn, that's a neighborhood. People come in, they go out. But that's not, that's, and, but, but we don't have any, any even we don't even have hotels. <laughs> we don't even have, that, most of our neighborhoods don't even qualify to be called neighborhoods. You know why? Because as you just indicated, the crime has gotten so bad in a neighborhood and so vicious and so run down and ragged and, and destructed that now they run the neighbors out and all you got left is the hood. That's why you hear people saying, I come from the hood. That means there's no neighbor anymore. The neighbor's been run out. He's moved someplace else or moved to another town outside into the suburbs. So we don't even have really only have neighborhoods. All we got is a hood. We don't even have the neighbors. So what we have to do is go back and say, how do you build a community? A community has, must have those things I talked about. A code of conduct. First, we must have a wholly independent economic structure that will provide services, goods, products, business opportunities, and a tax base for your own people. And once you get that, then you must also have a, what's it called a code of conduct, a code of etiquette that tells you how you treat everybody living in that community, how you how you support them, how you buy from them, how you protect them, how you service them, how you look after them, and how you place their interests first and before anybody else. That's a code of conduct. Every group in the country had a code of conduct. Whites had code of conduct all through slavery. They had codes of conduct and how they, each one would treat black folk. And, that's, and as a matter of fact, that's in 1705, they put out a code of conduct in 1705 into, in, into what's called a, the, the slave codes in 1705. It says, here's how a black person should be treated. Here's how every white person must respond to that black person. Nothing, and anything beyond this, the white folks would run you out of town 
Like if you, if you if you let a black man call you by your first name, or a black man look down on you, or a black man questioned you, or a black man uh, did reckless eyeballing on a white woman or touched a white woman, they had a code of conduct. We don't have a code of conduct. In our community, what we got is a thing, not, not a code of conduct. Uh, that uh, We have an operating principle that says, do your own thing. Do your own thing. Not a code of conduct. So people you're talking about to kill the black guy, they just say, well, you know, there's no code of conduct. It means go for yourself. Do your own thing. And you don't have you don't have to you don't have to get be approved by the community. And the last thing you the fact you need to have a community, you must have a, a body of elected officials who will put your interests and represent you politically in front and foremost on anything that goes down. We don't have any power. We don't, that's why we don't have the black leadership. We elect the black folk to office, but they but they don't they don't ascribe to the black community. The first thing a black person does nowadays has been doing it since about 1960s. He said, I'm gonna run for a public office. And the first thing I'm gonna do, if I, I want all you black folk to elect me and put me in office. And as soon as I get in office, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna represent all the people. And that just feeds the, 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 the entire principle of politics. Politics is a principle that says, you must be placed your values on yourself and your own people first. It's called quid pro quo, something for company. Something for something for one thing, which means a code of conduct. If I put you in office, you owe me. If I scratch your back, you scratch mine. But see, black folk don't have that code of conduct. So, so what they get when they get into public office, they want to represent everybody. But see, the whites whites code of conduct will never allow that to exist. They say if you get elected here and, and, uh, um, as a white man from Mississippi or Alabama coming to Washington D.C., he better not come here talking about he's representing black folk. He must represent his own people first. And so we don't have any communities. That's the first thing. No, no code of conduct, no economy, and no and no re responsible politicians that would protect their own people first and foremost. The produce, see they must become producers. And they have two levels of producing. The first level would be produce those things who are, which are absolutely essential for your survival. Now what would those be, Dr. Watkins? One, you have to be able to control one thing that's essential. Since the body is 75% water, you need to be trying to get put yourself in a position to make sure you got safe, clean water to be able to survive. That's one thing. Get into the water business, however you want to cut it. You can get into the bottled water business or be able to somehow figure out how you can have access to water, either through the public system or through the private system. Two, you must be able to have, you got to have food. You got to figure out how to get that you need to have connected to farms or to some agricultural sources where you can make sure that you got you can meet your daily dietary consumption needs by having enough food. 70% of black folk in America, America live outside of 10 major large metropolitan areas. They only got about a 10 to 13 day food supply. I can starve, I can starve almost 75, 70% of black folk people in America in, a, in about a less than a two week time. If I had a major store storm, a blizzard comes into the North for instance, I can almost starve them to death, you know why? Because the minute the people hear a storm is coming up north in these major cities, they will all rush to the grocery stores and to the supermarkets. They will clean out the shelves. There will be nothing left on those shelves because there will be no food supplies. Those major cities are supplied with food every 24 hours with trucks coming in and bringing it in. And, and black folks, there are no major supermarkets that are only controlled by black folk in those neighborhoods. They need to focus on how can they get into producing food and having food available for their people, point two, point three is they must have some source of energy. Now, wh where to get the energy from? What blacks you know in the energy business? And wh what I mean by energy, let's take electricity as an example. Uh, you need electricity to operate these cities. If you, if you, since most of blacks are living in big apartment cons cons uh, structures. Now, if you lose electric, electric capacity, guess what's gonna happen? You won't be able to get in, use the elevators, and really use electricity, you won't be able to go to this. Go, we won't be able to go to the gas stations. The pumps work off of computers and electricity. Everything. A major blizzard comes into a north with seven percent of where all the black folk live. They will freeze to death. They have no way of being able to get get any source of energy. They can't get food, and uh, and, and they won't and they, because they're dependent on surrounding communities. If there's anything left, they don't produce anything. And lastly, the fourth point, they should be thinking very seriously about how healthcare. Now, I see them all going to conf conventions and the conferences all carrying, selling little bottles as we got this kind of food, we got that kind of food. Uh, we got, we, health is a great, a great importance to us. Yes, it is. But where are your hospitals? Where are your facilities, your medical centers, your medical complexes? 
in the United States with 44 million black folk in America. Dr. Boris Watkins, you know about it. There are, 40, there are 44 million black folk in America. You got two hospitals in America. You got you got you got you got uh, one in Washington D.C. at Howard University, and you got one in in, in Harlem with Harlem Medical Hospital. Where are your where are your hospitals? You tell me where are the major hospitals that belong that black folk have control over, and they, and 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 it's and has it's staffed it with blacks in the medical field. Show me where your medical complexes are in the black communities. Show me a black neighborhood. Show me one in America that has that has medical complexes and hospitals in them. Those are the four. I'm just using those four right there as an example. That's at the top level. If you really want to get serious, you go down to the second level and say and follow the polynomics principles. I made that point over and over again for black folk for 50 to 60 damn years. What are you producing? And this is what Dr. answered. Well, you know, well, you know this. And I know what you're saying. It's too late if you go in a lot of these areas. Because right now, those, those areas are taken up by other groups, immigrants and whites. But you can win if you follow, follow polynomics principles. Learn how to do things. Learn how to dominate in business, Dr. Watkins. Wherever you dominate in, in the population or in consumer spending patterns. Did you hear what I said then? Dominate on those two bases at the second level. Either dominate where you had a, where you had a major population or two, dominate where you had a major, where you, on your consumer spending patterns. By that, I mean, if, you, if you're a city right now, like Detroit, Michigan was, which is a 92% population, you should be only controlling 92% of the businesses in that city because you're the dominant population. Why is it I go to a city where, where blacks are the dominant population, they have no businesses? Why is it, let's use that as an example. Two, if I look, go inside that city, look at those businesses. I can Detroit, use Detroit as an example, where you got like about three or 4% uh, Arab population. And guess what? Arabs control 90% of all the businesses in a city that is 92% black. Out of 146 gas stations in the city of Detroit, last time I checked, Arabs owned and was running 144. Only two were owned by blacks I heard recently, made those two going out of business. So I went past those four things: food, health, energy, and and, and uh, what do what do what do blacks own? Nothing in, in anywhere in the country. You're not you're not producing. You're consuming, and consuming comes from cons means to be wasted away or be set up to be deteriorated down to nothing. <clears throat> okay, well, and let's go back to the history a little bit. The primary purpose of all immigration in this country was based on two things: one was to bring whites in and empower them, empower them with what enrichment. Enrichment and what? Two things, land and free labor. They want to get free land from the Indians and free labor from black folk. That's the whole nature of people coming to this country. Contrary to whatever you hear and read in all these various books about all these immigrants who are coming to America looking for looking for happiness, looking for religious freedom. That, that's the biggest lies. Those are the biggest lies ever told. They were coming here, they could have found happiness in China, in Russia, in, in Europe, in Germany. They could have found happiness any place. And what they, what they, when we come here because of religious freedom, they could have gone out in the damn woods and prayed every night. Nobody cared. They were coming to America because they were invited here to be enriched with two things, free land and free black labor. And then, and once they got here, <clears throat> the land was free, but the land, but, and land, but the land didn't have very much value. Land had very little value. Andrew Jackson, the president said that over and over. He says that, that a black slave labor brings 90% of the value to the land which means you can go out and get all the land you want. It had no value until you brought a slave there who got and pulled down the trees, killed the bear, moved the rocks, build the bridges, build the houses, pick the cotton, rice, indigo. That black black labor and brought wealth into the land. Land was free. So white folks then, what they set up a struck construct that black folk need to keep in mind. Every white person came here. He came here looking first and foremost for land. That's why, as I said on 20 or 30 occasions with you, that George Washington said that over and over again, that the value in this country would be in the land. He said, therefore, I want 100,000 acres. <clears throat> and and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, give me 100,000. And, and Patrick Henry said, give me 65,000. And so every, and if you invite all these immigrants to come to America, they're looking, they're coming to America for unearned benefits. Those un unearned benefits must be in terms of something that they can measure. They can put their hands on material. Don't listen to that bull crap about, well, I want freedom and opportunity to vote. No blacks, no immigrants come to America to vote. 
They don't give a damn about voting. They could have stayed in their own country. They come in here to get material things they can measure so they can get wealth, power, and resources and take it to the bank. <clears throat> so that's what the construct. So every immigrant could get 650 acres of many set foot in the country. And for every slave, he got another 150 acres. Land was the basis of all this, was to be able to get that hand on that land. And the biggest thing they did, yes, they could they could raise tobacco, they could raise rice, they could raise corn, they could raise, they could raise indigo. But let's take one of them, take cotton for instance. And that's, the cotton, that's why cotton became king. It didn't become king because of the cotton. It became king because the land was there to raise it. And that's why every slave they put on there was required. We were required to pick a minimum <clears throat> of about three or 400 pounds of cotton a day. <clears throat> <clears throat> and what they see, typically they were required to put it in bales. The average one had to produce somewhere between um, a bale of cotton. And, 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 and the value of the, of the wealth of the slave uh, owner was how many bales of cotton a hand could, could pick. They call it hands. Every slave was called a hand. So every hand had to pick somewhere between 400 and 500 pounds of cotton. And that cotton would sell in, in bales. And then, and, then, and then a given year, he might be responsible for picking five or six bales, multiply that by the value of the cotton. The value of the cotton was only about 15 cents a pound. And, yet, and so they set up this whole structure based on what the land could produce. And that's where the wealth came from. That's why when slavery, when slavery, all before slavery ended, the wealth was based on the land in general, but not, but didn't have very much value, only about 10%, and 90% was the back of the slave. But once slavery ended, the wealth of this nation shipped, shifted. From the back of a slave, it shifted to Wall Street. <clears throat> Wall Street became the primary sort. And what they don't tell you, that's why it's called Wall Street. Wall Street is, was, a, was a community for black slaves. That's what, and that was built on the land that where black slaves lived. It was called Wall Street. That's what the wall was for. And they, so the wealth of this nation that was in the land and the slaves shifted to, to Wall Street in New York. And that's what wealth, and after that they started, because the value of a slave regulated the value of Wall Street then. The price price index was based on what a, what a slave cost and what a slave could produce, as I told you, in terms of cotton, rice, tobacco, and indigo. And so land was it was a, a tr tremendous important. So now for black folk in this country, you were denied in, in land specifically and solely to keep you impoverished. So black folk between 18, between, <clears throat> between uh, 1866 and 1920, black folk managed to acquire almost 20 million acres of land. Not the best land, but those slack slaves who couldn't holler, couldn't read and write acquired 20 million acres of land by 1920. <laughs> Keep this in mind. They, they couldn't read and write, but they had enough damn sense to know that land was important because they learned that from white folk. And by 1920, according to the census, they had acquired 20 million acres of land. <clears throat> what, what, After, happened, huh? what, happened, what happened to that 20 million acres of land? What, what? Two things. When, when, after World War after World War One, the slaves started coming back into the country that the Industrial Revolution really took off in the United States at that point. It was based on slavery. And they started inventing all kinds of new technology machinery. They, they invented a machine, for instance, that began one called a cotton picking machine. One cotton picking machine could pick 50 times more cotton than one person could in an hour. And so, they, so, and so black, they began to industrialize the South. And those blacks began to move out of the South and move North. But also those blacks who came back from the World War I uh, the racial hostility in this country had increased substantially. Why? The second reason was because they had approved the 19th Amendment for white women. And white women now was really going to lock down on black folk. And so white women started so poor the white man. So slave, I mean, racism really increased at that point in time in these small towns. So by 1920, 1921, you had what's called the, the, red, the red flood across this country. Because what happened like in Tulsa, Oklahoma was one of them. <clears throat> in all these major cities, starting about 1920, 1921, you had major race riots in all these cities all over the country. Well, it was Tulsa, it was Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Greenwood, Oklahoma, or Rosewood in Florida, or Wilmington, North Carolina. They had race in New York, they called a draft riot, everything. They were they were going crazy against black folk to shut black folk down and make sure they were no longer competitive. Because those blacks would come back from the war and want to be competitive. So blacks in the South found more confidence saying, we're gonna have a major mi black migration out of the South. So after world, after about 1920s, blacks began to migrate away from the land, heading north. 
looking for a promised land in the north. They've been again they're abandoning their properties. And the properties and they look at that 20 million acres begin to drop and decrease in number. And once they got in the north, a lot of them had to abandon their farms and they did and, they, and whites knew that. And so as black folk left the farms, white folk began to confiscate as much of that land as possible. Every spring about May, when the tax rolls went out for any unpaid taxes, they would go out and pick up tax certificates on any unpaid property in the South. And uh, and also, and blacks began to went up north. Once went up north, they could no longer they no longer had an interest in paying the taxes on property in the South or was abandoned. But in addition to that, whites also said we're gonna we're gonna re-enslave blacks and take some of that that land by by using it for industrial or private prisons. And so they began anytime anything that blacks owed white folk, they can imprison them for that and use them and take the land away from it. So black property dropped from 20 million down down to let about a little about a couple of million or so. And that's what happened to your property. They lost all that land. They got jobs up north in the in the steel mills, in the chemical factories, and the tire companies, and the automobile industry. That's what he went for. And they lost it. Most of that land has disappeared. Black folks need to understand is right now that land is being taken from them right now. The remainder of that, that property is being they're being they, it, it's being subtracted back into the white community as a result of the immigration process that started in the, eight, in the 1950s, where white folks abandoned large urban areas and moved to and created a new thing, phenomenon called suburbs. For, suburbs did not exist until the 1950s when the integration started. Whites started with what's called white flight. White flight meant whites going to get away from the inner cities, move out, urban, out of these urban areas, and take everything of value with them out to new land that they're going to develop called suburbs and exurbs and everybody else. And so black, when they, when they moved out, they took the they took the, the industries, the business, the tax base, the middle income and the voting power into the suburbs and left the black folk with, under what they call a scorched earth policy, which means you can own those, you can you can take over politically in those urban cities, but you're not gonna have any power and resources because we're gonna move it all to the suburbs. So we can still control you from the suburbs because economics runs over politics a thousand times with nothing left over. It's, it's economics that controls your system, and, and that's what that's what Trump is trying been trying to tell you. That's why you got 600 white multi-billionaires in the United States keep telling you the same thing: vote ain't worth a damn if you don't have money behind it. As a group, that's the difference. That's why that's why you can have a 13% black population in America uh, that has one half percent of anything of value. When just the opposite, you can have Jews that are one half percent of the population. They control almost 100% of some of these industries because black folk never got it through their heads, but it is money that makes the difference. Now watch the next election, they're gonna tell blacks how important it is to go out and vote. Vote for what? If you don't have any money to control the system, you get nothing. In the meantime, while you're out voting, these immigrants gonna gonna, gonna, gonna regentrify, gonna gentrify these cities, period. All these urban areas are gonna be gentrified. And right and along with the gentrification process comes the second protest, process like a train. You gotta, the, the, the engine, on, on, on taking back land, it's called gentrification. It's hooked into the next car behind it. That's called that's called privatization. Privatization means once we move in there and gentrify it, we're gonna bring in the second level, which is privatized. We're gonna privatize everything in there, and we and by setting up our own privately owned businesses that would that would that would that would gentrify white values of white culture and white ownership and businesses. And so that's what, and, and immigrants are gonna come in with the same thing and take it over. That's why Washington DC, there used to be Chocolate City, uh, back in the 78 when I came here with President Carter, is that with, with a 78% black population down to about 40, 41% now. Detroit, Michigan, there used to be 92, it's way down something like about 65, they lost half their population. Harlem, there used to be black, that's gone. And Harlem now is pretty much controlled by immigrants and whites. So what I'm saying is these cities are gonna be gentrified, but not only in terms of from the private side, they also want to take over all the major public entities in those cities. Once they gentrify you, they're going to take over all the public entities and put those into the hands of whites. Just lose Detroit, Michigan as again, as an example. Detroit, Michigan was, was, was known historically as one of the best cities in the country. But where you can go there and find nice home, had a high quality home, uh, home stock, residential home stock. They had a good housing stock. They had uh, some of the best job opportunities in the automobile industries and everything else you want to think about. But in there, they also had like like the, uh, the bridge to Canada. They had a tunnel to Canada. They had the riverfront. They had they had, uh, they had had uh, art institute, major art institute. They also had black history uh, museums there. But they had a golf course, but guess what's happening now? And they have Joe Louis Arena. 
all those things have gone into the hands of whites now. They're gonna go over there and take over, they're gonna take over the bridge to Canada, they're gonna take over the town to Canada, all each of those things produce money. They're gonna be privately owned. The bridge will be privately owned. The town will be privately owned. The golf course will be privately owned. The city airport in Detroit will be privately owned. And the uh, all the major uh, stadiums downtown, like the Jolis Arena or Cobo Hall would be privately owned. All the land on the riverfront would be private loan when it used to be in the public sector. Black folk never seem to get it. You know, and what you just finished asking the question about uh, the value of land, that's why in that first book, <coughs> excuse me, called Black Labor, White Wealth, what I did in that book was timeline everything, and you're very familiar with that book. I timeline to show every technique, every trick, every public policy, every custom, every law that they did to show how the wealth was maldistributed from the beginning all the way to the end, where every penny went in the white hands, how they made land, made, how they maldistributed the land, where they gave white folk two, two billion, not not million, but two billion acres of free land, and in that and in that land, that's where the wealth is. The land, the wealth is in the land. That was the gold, the silver, the chrome, the balsite, the magnesium, the, the cotton, the rice, the indigo, the gas, and the oil. They gave them two billion acres. And, I was, and, then, and then they started developing the West, they did the same thing to railroads. They had 11 railroad systems in the United States. They gave each railroad, uh, uh, Dr. Watkins, they gave each railroad land pick, picked up two million acres of free land. On each, and they got six miles of free land on both on either side of the railroads, as far as the eye can see across the United States. All that land and the wealth has been transferred general, to its subsequent generation in value. That's why whites right now only control uh, initially 99% of all the wealth in the country. Now it's down to 87%. 87, and really be, let, me, let me be a little more specific. 87.5% of all the wealth in this nation is now locked in box and frozen into the white society. Let me get you to understand that. That means only 13% is up for grabs. And then the blacks are gonna have to compete for that 13% with all these immigrants coming into the country. That's why right now your wealth is not increasing, it's going down backwards. You only had one half of 1% of the wealth at the end of slavery. And you and you notified me, told me the same thing about two or three weeks ago to talk. The latest projection is that in about another 19 to 21 years, that black, black wealth level is gonna be zero, Z-E-R-O in America. And, and even if white folk didn't gain any more wealth, from the wealth they got in the land already is being passed on from one generation to the next, to succeeding generation. It's been passed on. It's frozen in their stock accounts, their bonds, their trust accounts, their corporations, their, and everything else, their business opportunities. That's lo that wealth is locked in the, in the white community. And, it's, and, it's, and that wealth is gonna be passed on. But that means that if black, if whites didn't gain any more wealth from where they are right now, if if, if I were God, I say stop. As white people, you can't gain any more wealth. You you, you got you got 87 and a half percent locked and boxed in your communities, in your businesses, in your schools, in your banks. That's why everything, all every top big building in every city is owned by whites. Blacks don't own a damn thing from Boston to San Diego. Nothing. Drive through any city, look at all the business, go to all these malls all over the country. Blacks don't own a damn thing. But even if I were God and say, you whites cannot gain any more wealth than what you got. Stop, you You got to freeze right now. Guess what? It'll take black people another 239 years to catch up to where whites are right now. If whites didn't gain anymore. We got major problems and all that's in the land. Go back to your initial question about a half an hour ago. You asked me the value and importance of the land. The land is where you tell black don't give up any damn land to anybody. Stop moving from city to city. Social integration is as bad as, as gentrification. Where well, you're complicit, you're complicit by, 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 by committing integration out of your neighborhoods, uh, re reducing your communities and neighborhoods and giving the land to immigrants coming in or letting whites come in and build businesses, immigrants building. You're committing economic suicide. And mm. so what I'm saying to you, no, the land is where the wealth is. And that's why we, you asked about, you, your eyes rolled when I said that we lost 20 million. Right, right, it, it should be vertically ordered. Everything, every business you want to go into should be vertically ordered. Power and resource is always vertical, vertical, going from the highest to the lowest. And see, and most of these immigrants, they've been taught that culturally and acculturated to understand this before they get here. So product by vertical, I mean, at the production level at the bottom, that's the lowest level where you're producing. Then you, once you produce something, then you move up to the second level. 
that, that'll be that'll be wholesaling or distributorships on top of that. Then the top will be re retailing. Go straight up. In other words, learn how to control and own everything from the bottom to the top. You don't have don't go horizontal by, by having a lot of business spread out where, where, where people are underneath you and over you. That that's that's a death sentence. You try to lock it in boxes straight up from the bottom to the top. I am gonna put it in there so they can see it. Go all the way up. That's why in the seafood industry, I used to tell black folk, try to go vertical. You produce your seafood, you warehouse it, distribute it, and you sell it to retail restaurants and start red lobster chains, the restaurant if you want them. In other words, control everything in seafood from the boat to the throat. That's what I'm saying to you. Just try to control from the bottom to the top. And well, all we do is pick key industries. What are some of the key industries? What do blacks do? We should be controlling the shoe industry. We should be controlling the leather industry. We should be controlling the seafood industry. We should be controlling the hair industry. Any place where you dominate in a product, you should make sure nobody can penetrate it. And then, and, and you put that, you produce that product, you follow it all the way up to a, to a drugstore shelf or a grocery store shelf. You control everything from the distributorships, warehousing, wholesaling to retailing. Let nobody penetrate it. And that's, and that's how these other groups are shutting you out. The Chinese right now, they got your hair. 87, I mean, 84% of every dollar spent on black hair goes to Koreans. Mm. Because they're controlling the chain, they're producing the, the hair, the wigs, and the, everything, and all the way up. And it's every city, they, they sell you wigs, they sell you combs, they sell you hair processing ingredients, oil, shampoo, everything. Nail shops and everything. They got you shut out. And black folk find a comfort in going giving their money. They don't practice group economics. Other groups do. They, they would take your money from you, but shut you out of theirs. You can't get into the Asian market. They're not going to let, they got, Jews aren't going to let you come in there community to set up businesses. Asian, I let you come into Chinatown and put up no damn black restaurants in Chinatown. You can't go to Dearborn, Michigan, Arab Town and put up no black businesses. Black people are committing economic suicide. They want to wonder why they're getting ready to wipe off the face of the earth and why their economic wealth level will soon be zero in about 19 or 20 years. Whenever you have one of your schools, tell them I'm always available to come to your schools and assist you in, in pushing any principles and any information, the facts and data and history that might relate to the points that you're making. I'll be glad to come there and do it. And that's why also when they go buy those books, you tell them right now it's tremendously important for them to buy that power, the library pack that you mentioned earlier, the power Nomics library pack. They can get all five of those books plus a DVD covering how to best educate a black child. They get all that for $99. It's on a special. We run it because right now we're in serious trouble in this country. And, and, and I, that's why I deeply appreciate you and your schools. And I encourage all of them to try to enroll wherever they can. And I'll come anytime, any place, as long as my health stays stable, to come there and speak to you and help you push anything. But you tell them is buy those damn books and start reading them because those books will take them in a vertical order from the bottom to the top. The first book, Black Labor, White Wealth, shows you here's all the strategies, techniques, conditions, and attitudes that put you into a ditch and locked you in into it into a social construct a real life monopoly game that you cannot get out of. The second book, Power Nomics says, but but white racism is not perfect. You can beat it if you follow these Power Nomics principles. To the T, you can beat it. Thirdly, you got two Dirty Little Secrets books that says, here's why you're exceptional people, special people. Do not let them take you off into horizontal issues by calling you minorities and poor folk and people of color, multicultural diversity. That's BS. You are, racism is vertical and it's strictly against the white man to the black man. It's vertically ordered. Anything that respects power is always vertical. I don't care whether it's in religion or in, in geography or in politics, it's always vertically ordered. But racism is, is vertical. It, it, classism is horizontal. Stay with these horizontal issues like class, women, gays, midgets, all that kind of stuff. Uh, what political party you belong to, what religion belongs to, those are horizontal issues. They would never elevate you. All they do is spread you out, thin you out, make you more vulnerable than you ever were. And so you tell them to get all those books as quick as they can, 